Wan Luang King for ME CFS Alert. Today we have a picture, a frightening picture, but a very real picture of a young man who has left life. He's in it, he's alive, but he's not of it. He cannot live his life. He is a classic victim, a severe case of ME, a life under glass, a life separate, alive but not living. He is the son, the once gifted son, athlete, brilliant student of Mark and Dottie Camazand. Now he lies in a bed with two little senses to attract attention for what he needs. He can breathe and that is it. He cannot take light, he cannot take sound, he cannot talk. It is a terrible purgatory that he lives in. He's lucky to have these gifted parents. Dottie is a uh, doctor, a medical doctor, and uh, Mark is a scientist, also a PhD scientist, and a doctor as well. When did this happen? When was your son taken from this trajectory of hope and possibility and reduced to lying on a bed with things stuck into him? It was definitely January 2014, because we were all home for Christmas, all four of us, and he was happy, healthy, took his GREs for Stan at Stanford, and got perfect scores on two out of three sections. And then a week later, my wife, my daughter, and him all got ill. I didn't, luckily. And the other two recovered, and he never did. And he's still ill to this day. Do you think, Dottie, that what you all got ill with was, in fact, ME? or something that was a trigger for ME, and it triggered it in, in Tom and not in yourselves. I think it was probably a trigger. And with Tom, he had chills and night sweats one week as a college student. It was near the end of January. And my daughter and myself independently here in San Ramon, an hour away, also were ill with malaise and some unusual shivering. On the weekend, Tom called <coughs> to say that he had been sick with night sweats and chills. And then about two weeks later, he called home wanting to come home for the first time ever from Stanford when it was not a holiday break. And he had been coughing two nights all night long, unable to sleep. He came home for a long President's Day weekend, lots of coughing. I took him back to school on Tuesday afternoon for a four o'clock class. And he never really told me at that point that he did not fully recover from the illness. He would feel fatigued and he would stress himself to get an assignment done, and then he would have to lay in bed the next day and rest and recover from doing the work. But he was able to cope, he was able to keep up with classes, and so February and March, I was unaware that he had never returned to his normal baseline of health. He came home late March for spring break, and unfortunately, he picked up a cold that Mark had and went back to school, and it was at the end of that cold that he started calling home, telling me that he did not feel well. Only later did he ironically say that during the cold, the problem that he had been having where he didn't feel well seemed better. And so he thought whatever problem he had during February and March was going away. But then as the cold resolved, he started feeling terrible and far worse. He called home. I um, told him to go to Vaden Student Health and be seen. And that was the beginning of a very slow, progressive, devastating illness that we would have never dreamed 
was happening at the time he started calling home. Mark, when did he become totally bedridden? Uh, probably two years ago. Dottie's a lot better memory on this stuff, but about two years ago. And then he got to where he could do, it was somewhat bedridden, he could stand up and move to a porta potty sort of to use the facilities. And then eventually a year later, he couldn't even do that. And then uh, starting this year, he got so weak, he couldn't even eat anymore. He got to where he could only drink through a straw, ground up food, and then drink like that. And then he couldn't even do that. He couldn't even chew or swallow. So then in January, we took him to Kaiser and he was hospitalized for 60 days or so, or maybe a little more. 95. Well, eventually 95 days in the hospital in a row starting in January this year, 2017 and uh, they had to put in eventually a gastric feeding tube at Stanford. We got transferred to Stanford. And uh, then he started only being able to be fed with a bag, with a, sort of like an IV bag only for gastric. And that's the only way he could eat or drink now. And so he's totally bedridden. He can't um, get out of bed for any reason. Uh, you have to have paramedics come once in a while to take him in if he starts having very bad shakes and things. And that's happened a few times and they could barely get through the narrow door. Um, so he is now where he can only move his fingers, he can't move his hands. Uh, to communicate with the world, he has a pager in each hand. If he pushes one, it rings a bell and we come and help him. And if he drops one, he can't move his fan far enough to find it. So we have two strapped to his fingers so he cannot lose them. And if he does ever lose one when we only had one, he would be almost in tears. And so now we have two in case the battery goes dead or if he drops one, he's got a backup plan. But meanwhile, his mind is operating, he's thinking. Um, is he able to communicate thoughts or anything like, or he can't write and he can't speak? And is he able to communicate in any way? So, I saw you very sweetly kiss his hand. It was very moving. Um, this was, looked as though he was entirely unable to function in any way at all except to lie in that bed hoping for better days. The brief windows, Tom is there. He, in the fall, was better, and he could write briefly on a piece of paper and say a few words, or he would want to make a new signal. He would write a few words and then do the hand signal. When he was in the hospital, he also was still able to write at times and clearly was very much there. He would write on a piece of paper. Stimulus causes nerve firing, causes inflammation. The causes was just an arrow. So he was clearly there in communicating what his experience was. You have a certain, uh, hard to say, luck in a circumstance like this, but you are in a way fortunate because this is San Ramon, which is a very sophisticated part of California outside of San Francisco where there's a lot of good medicine, a lot of good research. It's a meds and eds area. Um, much worse, you could imagine, if you were in South Dakota, West Virginia, um, many of the states that I get telephone calls from, where there is no doctors who know anything about this and where the parents don't have any facilities. I just think that, honestly, Tom is so ill that if he was in other states, he could have easily died by now because doctors have no idea how to treat this which is a severe indictment of our medical system and how patchy it is. I actually think that because we scientifically do not understand this illness and we have not studied and found cures for this illness, that it doesn't matter where you are. You are left with a devastating illness that most doctors don't know accurate information, and even if you get a diagnosis, no one scientifically knows what we should do for these patients. Now, you're working with the group uh, Solve MECFS, and Carol Head, who is head of it, is going to 
come and sit in your chair. She's sitting just out camera sight. Uh, what is the effect of being part of one of these organizations? Does it give you hope? Does it encourage you to become a proselytizer, to go out and sell this disease as something that needs greater attention, greater research, and ergo more money? Yeah, I think there's clearly a lack of funding. It's really gross discrimination by the federal government against this disease. And so we have to raise awareness. My wife's an MD, so she puts a lot of focus on keeping my son alive. And I put a lot of focus on advocacy because if we don't get more research, he can die of this disease. So I'm trying to get all 50 states to be totally aware and get proclamations from states. I wrote a state of Pro California resolution, SCR 40, that just got passed. And it is now law of California that we should promote awareness Georgia passed a unanimous vote for similar proclamation, six states total. We need 50 states on board for me. And once we have 50 states on board, 100 senators better be for me or they should be voted out of office. I can tell you as a journalist who's seen many things in all sorts of places, war zones, etc., seeing that great young man laid out like that is heart shredding. It must be horrendous to live with, and I salute your courage. Thank you for coming on the broadcast. Keep good work going. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we thank Solve so much for all of their advocacy. It is critical that our agencies that are for our health, the CDC and the NIH, acknowledge educate physicians, and research this disease. Now Carol Head, who is the Chief Executive Officer and President of Solve MECFS Initiative, has joined me. Carol, You've seen the situation here in this home with this terribly sick child and these wonderful parents. Yeah. What does that do to you? It, it stiffens my resolve. You know, there are um, so many, there are so many individuals like Tom Commonson who are suffering in the manner that he is. And yet at the same time, it is touching. It is moving to be in the house with him, knowing his presence here. And to talk with his parents, who truly are extraordinary activists uh, for this disease, it it um, it, it reminds reminds me again of what I do and why I do it. And there are so many people who are not fortunate um, to have the kind of support and help that Tom has. Um, and and even with that, it is a desperate situation, a a, a life that has been cut short in terms of his vibrancy, his contribution to society, um, all we might have gained for him, and it's, it is truly heartbreaking. I think of it as a life that has been taken and imprisoned, yes. a life yeah. in parallel, but a fraction of life yes. in parallel yes. compared to a full life. Yes. Uh, your organization works very hard to raise money for research, mm -hmm. does some direct research, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it and what do you need? Well, we, we are, prime. it's the Solve MECFS initiative, often shortened to SMCI, and we are primarily a research organization. You know, <clears throat> when you think of Michael J. Fox for Parkinson's or Su Susan J. Coma for breast cancer, we are that organization for MECFS. So we primarily do research, and there are three key elements to our research program. First, we fund direct research that we, direct, we do ourselves with some of the most um, prestigious universities, both in America and abroad. Um, we also give grants to promising new researchers. Every year, we give three or four grants to, to folks who, who may be working in neurology or immunology, but who have an interest in this field. And we all know how important it is to get new researchers into it. And then the third key element of our research program is a registry. We are um, working with the NIH um, and building a patient registry. And that is a tool that will, that will serve any NIH and all is reaches. the National Institutes of Health. Yes, thank that you. That is the government's 
lead agency. Yes, yes, yeah, in yes. This part of the yes. research spectrum. Uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Yes, uh, NIH is critically important to this disease. But we're building. Um, uh, we got a, a grant um, to build a registry for the disease that has both patients, well characterized patients, and controls, so that any qualified researcher anywhere in the world. Can, can use the registry to, to do research. It really accelerates the research process. In many instances, research can be held up because they can't find patients, so we, we help with that. Can you find the researchers? Um, you know, I've watched science yes. over 50 years yeah. from a perch in Washington, mm -hmm. and there are various moments when a particular branch of science or medicine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is sexy. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of the AIDS crisis, I tried to start a, a, a newsletter. I was publishing mm. high-priced newsletters, and I couldn't find anybody to staff it. Mm. Then when the celebrities endorsed AIDS mm -hmm. research, everybody mm -hmm. wanted to work on AIDS research. Right. Right. Uh, have you come to that moment of, it seems like a terrible thing to say about a right. disease, right. but made it sexy right. to researchers right. so good minds can come into right. the field? Well, would that we had. Um, we have not yet. Um, there are, you know, it, it, there there are so many elements of this disease that have led to its being so desperately underfunded. Um, it's sort of the the perfect storm of four factors. You know, it is first as as you've noted. It is suffered by 2.5 million Americans. These are federal figures, not mine. And the we've seen from Tom, who is one of the severe. But they're not all as sick as Tom. Yeah, they're not all as sick as Tom. They're all as sick as Tom. Yeah, I, I know three yes. others personally. Sure. We talk with so many patients, and and it's a disease that has a very wide range on the spectrum. Tom is among the sickest, and 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 there, there's another end of the range. But so here's the 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 perplexing Excuse piece. Me. Uh, hold yeah. that thought. But is there a measurement system? Yes. Is there a stage four, stage eight, stage ah. one, ah. so that he would be, if you use cancer as an example, yeah. stage four? Yeah. Uh, is there a measure? Yeah, you know, just like so many needs for research in, uh, in this disease, no, there is not. We know this anecdotally from talking with so many folks. But there's a perfect storm, you know, so here's a disease that affects 2.5 million Americans. I mean, that's a health crisis. That's the population of the entire city of Fort Worth, Texas, who's sick. Imagine if they all became sick. Not all as severe as Tom, but many. And, and whose lives have been diminished significantly. So imagine that. And imagine that the federal funding for this disease has been so low, less than is spent by the federal government on male pattern baldness, on hay fever. And so how can this be, right? You know, how, how can it be that such a desperately bad disease with so many patients be so underfunded? It really, you know, it, it does make sense when you look at it. First, it's truly an extremely complex disease. I mean, I could, I could make the argument that it's fundamentally neurological or immunological or due to a number of other problems. It's very complex. Let me just, two other, it is also, there's no one biomarker. You go to your doctor, your doctor can pretty well diagnose autism or breast cancer. There are known metrics. There are none for this disease. Third, it's primarily suffered by women. You know, certainly there are many men like Tom who suffer, but I, I think it's very well documented that diseases that primarily affect women do get less attention. That has been historically true. Um, and last, it's had this horrible name, chronic fatigue syndrome. We, I can barely get the words out. We call it now, as you have graciously, myalgic encephalomyelitis. I think the name itself has invited it to be scorned, um, to be not believed to be the serious, dramatic disease as, that as it is. As yuppie flu. They call yes. it yuppie uh, flu. Uh, yes, yeah. A really yeah. Dim yeah. dismissive name. Yeah, they're utterly dismissive. Pejorative, too. Yes. And so many people who have the disease, because it is stigmatized, don't talk about it, so it's not known. But you put those four factors together, and it is you can sort of understand how we can be at this point in 2017 with so many who are so desperately sick, and there's still very little funding available. What can the community, people yeah. watching this program right now, 
yeah. do to help you? Well, let me, so th thank you for that. First off, we are primarily a research organization, and as you know, research costs money. So we always, we have so much work we would love to do if we had sufficient funds. But the other element of what we have taken on in the last two years is advocacy. And by that I mean thoughtful, strategic efforts to, to go to Washington and work through we are now partnering with the NIH. We are working with the CDC. We are also, we have relationships now with congressionals, both in the Senate and the House, so that when we send out a message about, you know, a loss of CDC funding, we now have a contingent of folks in the Congress who understand us. And that, you know, working through the federal government has its own set of challenges, as we all know, but we really are making inroads there um, in that. And so, Thank you for what can people do? You know, truly for us and other organizations, funding is the critical issue. We understand enough to know what the next steps are. We cannot fund them. We can also come to our website, solvecfs.org, um, sign up, get information about the disease. We send out free newsletters that provide information. And certainly, we'll be doing another lobby day next spring. You know, join us in our advocacy efforts. Have you had any luck with the big foundations? which have made a big difference in particular diseases, yeah. where they've been able to sustain funding at large sums, say $10 million, yes. year after year after year, rather than what tends to happen otherwise, which is a government grant that runs yes. out, and then, yes. then that's the end. And this is yeah. very debilitating yeah. for the researcher and disastrous for the patient. You know, we, the short answer is no, we have not, and it's not for lack of trying. Um, you know, big foundations are a world unto themselves. We now have an expert on our staff who really, who has gotten large foundation grants in, in the past and really understands the, the many steps required. But I would say, you know, just as this disease sort of doesn't fit in any one specialty, neurological, immunological, viral, it also, we have a hard time finding foundations that, that will take the time, if you will, they're busy, they have many priorities, we respect that, but to really grasp the enormity of the problem and the difference that they could make for so many patients. Thank you so much, Carol. And I think we will end so people remember just how grave this disease is by having another look at poor Tom and a moment to hope that he recovers. Yeah.